So patient-centered care, early detection of colorectal cancer, don't get left behind. 45 is the new 50, and I think you'll understand a lot more about that after our pre presenters have, have shared information with you today. Rachel Hershey, PhD, RN, and Tammy Triglianos, DNP, ANPBC, AOCNP. So uh, next slide, please. Our, our, uh, one of our presenters is pre-recorded today, and she'll be uh, joining via that re recording that's been made a little later this afternoon. Dr. Hershey's research has been funded by the Oncology Nursing Foundation, the National Institute of Nursing Research, and the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Her work is focused on using multi-level approaches to decrease cancer health disparities between black and white patients. Her research and service activities are guided by a community advisory board. Dr. Hershey serves on the Oncology Nursing Society Triangle Chapter Board as co-chair of leadership and mentorship. She is passionate about working with oncology nurses and students to develop and implement evidence-based research for sustained practice changes that will improve cancer outcomes and health equity across populations. Next slide, please. And Tammy Triglianos, DNP, ANP, BC, AOCNP, is a certified adult oncology nurse practitioner with over 20 years of experience caring for cancer patients. She currently works in the gastrointestinal cancer program at UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and plays a key role in multidisciplinary uh, liver in the in the multidisciplinary liver clinic. She serves as the APP lead for the Division of Oncology, and she is a member of the APP Mentoring Committee. She is also an adjunct faculty member at the UNC School of Nursing and precepts nurse practitioner students. She recently joined the Board of Oncology Nursing Society Triangle Chapter. Tammy, welcome. We are so glad to have you here today. Thank you, Tim. Happy to be here. So what, what's one thing we should know outside of your professional bio that's not mentioned there? Um, probably something unique that people wouldn't guess about me is um, prior to starting a, a family, my husband and I um, owned Harleys and would go uh, bike riding and touring the, the backcountry roads of Chatham County. Great, great. Oh, that sounds wonderful. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, again, to our audience, thank you for, for being here. We're so happy that, that you've joined us and taken part of your day uh, to, to learn about this important topic. Uh, let's go ahead and go on to that next slide. Just remind you, we're going to be using Poll Everywhere, totally, uh, totally uh, anonymous. Uh, our first question, we always make this kind of a softball. What is the gold standard for colorectal cancer screening? A, stool test, B, colonoscopy, C, blood tests, or D, nasal swab? Um, I think there's at least one really obvious outlier there, but we'll, we'll see what you come up with. Um, if you'd go ahead and, and do the next slide, please. And while we're uh, waiting for that, we'll say this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing continuing professional development. William A. Wood, MD, MPH, and the CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Greensboro Area Health Education Center is approved as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the North Carolina Nurses Association, an accredited approver approver of the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. Tammy Triglianos and Rachel Hershey have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And the next slide, please. And let's see, uh, this opens this up. We're uh, already uh, landing heavily on the on answer B, the colonoscopy. Um, no nasal swab answers yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, it take just a few more seconds. Tammy, how are they doing? I, I, I think they nailed it. Yep. Great. Oh, we do have a nasal swab answer. Well, good for good for, for that. Thanks for bringing in some humor today. Absolutely. And hey, maybe maybe you know you never know. Things could change. So, <laughs> all right, we'll uh, we'll let you take it from there. So, uh, thank you so much again for being here. 
Great, thank you, Tim. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this afternoon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to spending the next hour with you to discuss colorectal cancer screening and the importance of early detection. So many of you may be familiar with the updated guidelines on colorectal um, screening, but some of you may not be. So new screening guidelines have lowered the age um, to recommend screening to begin at age 45 instead of 50. So don't get left behind. Here are our objectives today. We'll go through some risk factors of colorectal cancer and review the screening recommendations and modalities. Um, we'll talk through some disparities and barriers of colorectal cancer. Um, and then we'll finish up with um, reviewing some healthy lifestyle interventions. So our agenda today, um, we'll go through these topics and then um, we'll first start with an overview of colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer, many times colon and rectal cancer are actually coined together in one term for colorectal cancer, but keep in mind they're actually two different cancers um, treated differently, but much, most of the time have very similar features. To review some statistics, um, it is the third most common cancer diagnosed in men and women in the United States. It's the second lead leading cause of cancer-related deaths. And it, uh, colorectal cancer accounts for about 8% of all new cancer cases in the US. But the good news is there is a decline in mortality from colorectal cancer. And this is mostly attributed to improved treatments and the development of novel treatment approaches. Um, the use of screening techniques, um, as well as some pattern changes in risk factors, um, things like a decrease in smoking, for example. So this chart is showing you the new cases of colorectal cancer by age group, all races, both males and females. So looking at the median age of onset, with this red arrow, it's showing you that the higher incidence of new cases of colorectal cancer are happening in the 65 to 74 age range with the median onset of about 67. This median age onset has actually shifted from the early 2000s in which the median age of onset was around 72. So this is happening because of an increasing incidence in our younger population, which you can see in this subgroup in the 35 to 55 age range. We'll take a closer look at this on the next slide. So this um, graph is showing you age of onset with um, uh, for four year in four year intervals for colorectal cancer. So that top line, the light green line, is showing you ages the age group of 55 to 59. And the incidence rates of this age group are actually decreasing by about 3.6%. The bottom two lines, the medium um, green and the darker green line are age groups 50 to 54. And um, the, the lower line, the darker green is the 45 to 49 year old age range. Um, and this age of onset and the increase has increased about um, by 2%. Reasons for this are actually unknown at this point. Um, there's lots of thoughts and ideas that this may be related to things like an increase in sedentary lifestyle, a higher prevalence of obesity, even unfavorable diet patterns, um, among some other ideas. Now, when we break down the rate of new cases by race and ethnicity, as well as sex, the colorectal cancer incidence remains highest among Blacks than among any other racial or ethnic group, with incidence rates um, about 20% higher than those among non-Hispanic whites. It's also important to note that mortality rates are higher, um, about 40% greater in Black than non-Hispanic whites. So we'll review this in a little bit more detail by my colleague, Dr. Hershey, later in the talk. So to understand screening and the importance of screening in preventing progressive colorectal cancers, I think it's important to understand cancer staging itself. 
So to briefly review, a stage one cancer has a smaller tumor size or extent of invasion. You can see in the bottom picture, um, the uh, stages of disease with stage one being pretty small. Um, and then a stage two cancer be a bigger tumor size or depth of invasion into the colon wall. Um, both a stage one and a stage two um, don't have any spread to lymph nodes or other organs, and these are termed localized cancers. A stage three cancer can essentially be any tumor size, but now has spread to lymph nodes, um, but no spread to um, distant organs, and now this is termed regional spread of disease. A stage four cancer, again, any tumor size, lymph node involvement, um, but now stage four, it's spread outside the primary site to a distant organ, um, hence termed metastatic disease or distant spread of disease. So as we look at incidence of cases in survival by stage, it can help with the understanding of why diagnosing um, a colorectal cancer early is so important. As we look at this slide, we can see that most cases are um, diagnosed when they're confined to the primary site in that dark green color, 37% are diagnosed when they're localized, um, which is great, but not too far behind that at 36%, um, you can see that a third of the cases are diagnosed when they've spread to nearby lymph nodes. And at 22% um, of colorectal cancers are diagnosed when they've already spread or metastasized, and that number is just too high. So looking at the five-year survival of colorectal cancer stage, um, based on stage of disease, um, when we diagnose cancers earlier at a more localized stage, um, the five-year survival rate is much higher. It's over 90%. This decreases to um, uh, about 72% once the cancer has spread to near, nearby lymph nodes or regional spread of the cancer. And unfortunately, those diagnosed at a later stage or stage four disease have a much lower five-year survival of less than 15%. So now let's move on to risk factors for colorectal cancer. So non-modifiable risk factors, um, those are things that we can't change. We have no control over these things. Things like a first degree relative who was diagnosed with a colorectal cancer or your own personal history. Um, also a personal history of high risk adenomas or polyps in the colon. Um, things like genetic syndromes, for example, Lynch syndrome or familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP. Um, other um, inflammatory um, diseases, a personal history of ulcerative colitis or even Crohn's disease, um, increasing age, and as well as race. So looking at the um, non-modifiable risk factors based on incidence, most cancers happen sporadically. Many people may have a family history of cancer, but most are not due to inherited causes. So in sporadic cancer, which make up about 65% of cancers, the gene mutations that cause the cancer are acquired or occur in the tumor cells and are not inherited. Risk for acquired gene mutations increases with age and is often um, influenced by other things like the environment or lifestyle or medical factors. And unfortunately, the cancer actually just happens by chance. So familial cancers make up about 30% of cases, um, and these happen in a cluster of a family. So the cancer doesn't seem to be caused by a change in one gene. Instead, familial cancers are thought to be the result of mu multiple influences. So a combination of maybe several genes and other factors like diet or exercise may all contribute just a small amount each for an increased risk of developing a cancer. So such families have a moderately increased risk to develop cancer and it's often um, not possible to pinpoint uh, the exact cause. Um, and um, much of the time genetic testing may not even be recommended, but I think these are situations that it's still important to refer to your genetic counselors to do a deep family history and know um, and determine whether genetic testing would be warranted. Um, 
However, much of the time in these families, recommendation for more frequent screening or even earlier screening would be recommended. And then we have our inherited um, cancers. And those are uh, make up about less than 5% of cancers. And the these are a consequence of germline mutations in specific genes that increase the susceptibility um, of developing a cancer. Um, these gene mutations are present at birth, and usually the mutation will be passed down from a mother or father. So because of this, there's a recognizable pattern of cancer on one side of the family. And um, things like um, age of onset at a young age may be um, a clue that this is happening, or even unusual cancers, for example, like a male breast cancer. So we talked about non-modifiable risk factors for colorectal cancer. So now let's talk about modifiable risk factors. And I have this open-ended um, free text question for you all. Um, what are modifiable risk factors for colorectal cancer? So things that we um, can change or have control over, diet, great. Diet's a popular one. I'm seeing a theme in the audience. Any other ideas? Smoking, awesome, yes. I'm gonna give another second or two. An exercise, great. So we got three different, um, yeah, great. So let's review those um, in a little bit more detail. Yeah, certainly lifestyle. So um, these are, you know, some of those things that may contribute. Increasing alcoholic beverages per day, specifically three or more, but having frequent alcohol intake, smoking cigarettes or other nicotine products. Um, obesity, not maintaining a healthy weight, um, lack of physical activity or sedentary lifestyles, um, consumption of red or processed meats, which we'll talk more specifically about later, which I know all the bacon lovers out there aren't going to like it, but um, also diets that are higher in fat and lower in fiber. And there's other thoughts um, that other mechanisms may play a role, um, things like the gut microbiome or even antibiotic use. Um, possibility of um, in utero or childhood um, exposures. So most of these um, items that are listed on this slide um, are habit and require behavior change, which is not always the easiest thing to change, but we, we, we can and have control over those. So now let's um, go through our screening guidelines. So our next poll everywhere question, so what percent of the U.S. population age 50 to 75 are not up to date on colorectal cancer screening? So keep in mind, this is prior to the lower recommendations. Um, this is so interesting, yeah. The majority are saying 50%. I know, too many. But at least no one's picking 15% because, um, yeah, we are behind on this. And um, so 30% of the U.S. population are not up to date on screening. So we have screening tools that are meant to prevent a cancer or catch a cancer early. Um, and still, 30% of the population are not participating. We'll try chat through a little bit of that later on. But many times a colorectal cancer does not cause symptoms until it is a more advanced. So early detection and diagnosis can greatly affect survival and even prevent a cancer from forming. So just to touch upon some screening statistics here in North Carolina, about seven out of 10 adults age 50 to 75 are up to date. Um, on screening. So this coincides with the US population of 30% not being up to date. And about 20% of adults um, age 50 to 75 
have actually never been screened um, in 2020. So it's too early to discuss whether lowering the age recommendations um, will have an impact on these um, screening percentages. So 45 is the new 50. So um, the American Cancer Society was the first to lower the age recommendation back in 2018 um, for men and women at average risk of colorectal cancer um, should start screening at age 45. And we'll talk later about higher risk um, subgroups as well as getting into specifics of the screening modalities. So three years later, in May of 2020, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force finally joined the American Cancer Society and lowered the age recommendation. So they determined this a grade B recommendation for ages 45 to 49 to start screening. And a B recommendation just means that um, clinicians should um, provide this or recommend this and that there's at least fair evidence that um, this service would improve a health outcome and that the benefits actually outweigh the harms. So let's get into um, the screening modalities. So um, first we'll talk about our stool-based tests. So fecal occult blood tests detects hidden blood in stool. So these are um, it's three cards that are needed, so three specimens on three different days for a 10-day period. Foods and drugs may um, impact the results of this test. It is recommended yearly, and then if positive, a colonoscopy would be recommended. Um, the other stool-based stool test is fit testing, or immunochemical fecal occult blood. So again, detects hidden blood in stool. Um, so this is a single specimen, again, recommended yearly. Um, and there's no drug or dietary restrictions um, for this test. And again, if it's positive, a colonoscopy would be um, recommended. So with the fecal occult blood test and fit testing, it's important to stress to um, people who are choosing this method that there must be a commitment to the annual at-home testing with adherence to the manufacturer's instructions and collected as they recommend, because then there becomes limited sensitivity with the results with just one-time testing or random testing. So for people that aren't committed to doing it yearly as recommended, um, it's really a poor choice. And then we have Cologuard, which is um, a stool DNA test for cancer and precancer detection. So colorectal cancer and um, polyp cells often have DNA mutations in certain genes. Um, so this detects DNA changes as well as blood in the stool. This is recommended only every three years. But again, like uh, the other stool-based tests, if positive, a colonoscopy would be warranted. And then we have our structural tests, which um, include a virtual or CT colonography. This is recommended every five years. We have a flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years. And then as you all know from our first um, Poll Everywhere question, the gold standard colonoscopy recommended every 10 years. And again, these recommendations are for average risk um, people. So finding and removing polyps um, can prevent colon cancer or detect a cancer at an earlier stage. Um, the likelihood of a polyp or an adenoma becoming a cancer increases with um, increasing size. So what's the best test? Um, it's actually the one that gets done. So screening, utilization, and adherence could be improved by offering a choice of tests. And as we go through barriers in a little bit, um, understanding those can help um, you decide with your patients um, which screening modality to choose. So hopefully with an increased uptake of colorectal cancer screening with earlier detection, we may see um, initial results with increasing rates of local stage disease, but hopefully that means a decrease in rates of more advanced stage disease. So we know that early detection through screening can prevent cancers from becoming symptomatic or getting bigger. So in this review paper by Patel and Anen, they looked at epidemiology, risk factors, prevention and detection, 
um, prevention and treatment, and um, molecular features of early onset colorectal cancer. So when looking specifically at the bottom line there, time from symptoms to diagnosis, the first column is all age groups, and then the second column is um, less than age 50. So time to diagnosis was much longer in the less than 50 age group. Um, so delay in diagnosis could be related to a variety of reasons, like even the patient not seeking care or addressing any symptoms that may arise. But it's really critical to think about the role of the healthcare provider and not dismissing symptoms. Um, so there's um, work ongoing that's looking at molecular and even mutational changes um, of early onset colorectal cancer, um, which may actually be distinct from middle-aged, which could be even um, more distinct from older age colorectal cancers. So to highlight this point, I really want um, to send the message about um, not dismissing symptoms. And um, our first um, patient case is a 43-year-old gentleman who was found to have iron deficiency anemia about one year prior to his diagnosis, and he was started on an iron supplement without further workup. Um, he then, just a little bit closer to his diagnosis, he had an emergency room visit for constipation, and he was given laxatives and sent home, and then developed rectal bleeding, and finally a colonoscopy was performed, and he was found to have a 7-centimeter rectal mass, which was positive for adenocarcinoma. He had a microsatellite-stable tumor. Um, so this means there wasn't Lynch sim syndrome, it's not an inherited cancer, and um, no family history. Our next case is a 30-year-old female who um, no family history, non-significant past medical history, who had bright red blood per rectum that had waxed and waned over a period of time um, and then became persistent. Um, she was eventually referred for a colonoscopy, was found to have a five centimeter rectal mass, also had two additional polyps, again, um, positive for adenocarcinoma, a microsatellite stable tumor, so not an inherited cancer. And then our third case is um, a young gentleman, 42 years old, who had a change in bowel movements over a one-year period, progressed to bloody bowel movements, he had rectal pain. He was actually treated for an anal fissure for a period of months. And then when his symptoms didn't improve with that management, he was finally referred for a colonoscopy. He was found to have a five centimeter rectal mass, positive for adenocarcinoma again, microsatellite stable tumor, not inherited cancer, no family history um, to put on anyone's radar. Um, so all of these cases are um, people under age 45 who had a change in symptoms, um, was initially chalked up to be something other than a cancer. Um, so I think probably in the big pool and big picture, you know, most cases may not turn out to be a cancer, but I think it's important not to miss these examples. So our next poll everywhere question. So you have a 35 year old patient who you are seeing in the office. They're asking you um, for colorectal cancer screening. So you are a great clinician and you do a thorough family history and you find out that her mother was diagnosed with colon cancer at age 50. So when do you recommend that she start screening? Either A, she should have already had screening, B, now at age 35, at age 40 or age 45. So quite a mix. I know after I just gave you all those um, examples, you want her to get screened now. So I, I get that. So we'll talk um, uh, in more detail, um, not on this next slide, but one more slide, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this detail. But prior to that, I want to share this case with you all. So this is a 25-year-old female, um, no past medical history, 
of note, father um, was passed away in his 30s from um, a gastric cancer. She developed lower abdominal pain as well as constipation. She self-treated that with laxatives. Um, and then eventually when she developed blood in the stool, this prompted emergency room visit. They did a CAT scan in the emergency room, which was normal, showed no concern. But thankfully, she was referred for follow-up with GI. And um, went and saw GI. They recommended a colonoscopy. She was found to have a 10-centimeter rectosigmoid mass. And um, she actually had a microsatellite high tumor, which is um, coincides with Lynch syndrome. So important to note family history, which previously, I'm not sure that she had um, shared this, but a gastric cancer, a first degree relative with gastric cancer in his 30s should be on your radar. So when do we screen under age 45? So family history. So the example of the 35 year old requesting screening, if her mom was diagnosed at age 50, she should at least start screening 10 years earlier than the age of onset of the immediate family member. So by age 40, she should start screening. But if she was 35 and asking for it and insurance would cover it, Sure, certainly reasonable to screen her um, now, given her mom's family history, her mom's history. Um, so prompt evaluation of symptoms. Uh, those cases, you know, hopefully, you know, share that we should be paying attention and not just um, assuming it's a hemorrhoid or a fissure or, you know, normal constipation. Um, and then focusing on our higher risk subgroups. Um, the Black and Hispanic population. Um, and then that brings us into our um, topic of disparities and barriers to screening. And I will turn it over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Hershey, who um, could not be with us in person today, but um, I appreciate her still participating and sharing um, this video clip with you. We see significant disparities in colorectal cancer between patients of different races. Today, I'm going to focus on the most significant of these disparities, which is also my area of research, that's colorectal cancer disparities between black and white patients. So what you can see here is that white patients, like depicted in the bar on the left, are screened for colorectal cancer less often as compared to black patients depicted in the bar on the right. And we also see disparities in colorectal cancer incidence, <clears throat> with incidence being the highest among non-Hispanic Black patients compared to patients of all other races. And you can see that this persists within that group, that first group of bars there, with non-Hispanic Black patients being represented in the bar, the light green bar that's all the way to the left, and this persists when we look at sexes combined and also men and women individually. And finally, uh, disturbingly, we also see that this trend carries forward with black individuals dying more from colorectal cancer as compared to patients of all other races. Now, with advancements in colorectal cancer and screening over the last several decades, incidence and mortality has overall decreased. However, disparities have persisted. If you look at that first, the, the group of lines that's on the top, we can look at incidence. And we see that that incidence was similar among patients until around the mid-1980s. And then rates remained constant among Black patients while they started declining among white patients. And this was in part due to earlier access to treatment and better uptake of cancer screening among white patients. And then if we look at the group of lines on the bottom there, we can see that related to mortality, colorectal cancer rates, um, death rates among white patients began to decline around the 1970s, while death rates among black patients actually increased in the 70s and 80s, and then finally started to decline in the 90s, and disparities persist to then. Now, in addition, we see treatment disparities in colorectal cancer treatment between black and white 
patients in which black patients are less likely to receive surgical treatment, undergo chemotherapy, undergo radiation, and be referred to or eligible for clinical trials. And then among our patients who do undergo disparities, or do, excuse me, do undergo treatment, we see that our black patients have higher rates of post-surgical complications in hospital mortality, greater lengths in hospital stay, and they incur more treatment costs. So these disparities are well established and it's past time that uh, we go beyond identifying them and describing them. And it's time to really fully understand the group causes and most importantly, understand how we will mitigate these disparities. And that brings us to the social determinants of health, the conditions in which we are born, live, work, worship, and play and age. And in this context of disparities between patients who have been assigned to different races, we cannot consider how the social determinants of health operate to impact disparities without having racism on the forefront of our minds. So before we review how, excuse me, the social determinants of health impact disparities, let's briefly organize how racism relates to each of the domains of the social determinants of health. So since the beginnings of our country, there has been significant differentials in the distribution of power and wealth among, and resources among patients, uh, among black and white people across all of these domains. <clears throat> For example, related to economic stability, in 1705, upon completing servitude, white but not black indentured servants were paid 50 acres of land, 30 shillings, a musket, and 10 bushels of corn. And this is where it began, but then over the course of the, the centuries and the years, many policies and policies have upheld these differentials. So when we fast forward to 2020, that's when it was identified that black people are making about 20% less than white people for the same work with the same qualifications. Now, prohibited um, teaching enslaved people to read. And today we see the effects um, persist, where compared to white students, black students are likely to receive lower grades, more likely to drop out of school, and less likely to go to college and to graduate school and receive graduate degrees. And we call this the, bl the black-white achievement gap. Now related to healthcare access and quality, healthcare access and quality, in 1910, the Flexner, reported, or the Flexner Report closed five out of seven existing medical schools which trained black physicians. And then in 1946, the Hill-Burton Act contained a separate but equal clause which, per, which permitted many Southern hospitals to continue to prohibit black patients and black doctors from being parts of those hospitals. And today we see these disparities in health, we see disparities in health outcomes between black and white patients as a result of some of these things. And that brings us to what we're discussing today. And you may ask, why am I referencing a few of these historical policies and how they influence the social determinants of health? Now, we know that the social determinants of health impact cancer outcomes. And we know historical and present day structural systemic policies lead to practices and inequities in the social determinants of health between different races. So in order to mitigate these disparities, we need to change systems and structures. Learning to check our biases, communicate better with patients, and refer patients to resources, it's only going to go so far. Our work needs to extend beyond how we interact with our patients to also consider how we live our lives how we vote, how we contribute to policy, how we engage with our communities, and how we spend our money. So now that we've had an orientation of the interplay between racism and the social determinants of health, I'm gonna provide a brief overview of what we know specifically about the social determinants of health contributors to colorectal cancer disparities between black and white patients. Now, related to the neighborhood and built environment, we know that proper diet um, and physical activity impact colorectal cancer occurrence and outcomes. 
However, uh, there are structural differentials in access to affordable and healthy food and safe places for physical activity. But so you know, it isn't just about educating and motivating our patients to live healthy lifestyles, but there are real structural um, barriers for many of our Black patients. And as we just reviewed, these are rooted in structural racism. Now, related to economic stability, Research has identified that the insurance cover, insurance coverage, cost of procedures, and lack of time off of work directly contributes to colorectal cancer disparities between black and white patients. And related to education access and policy, research identifies that black patients may have false understandings about colorectal cancer. Specifically common misunderstandings that have been identified include um, Understanding what screening truly involves, not knowing causes or pre preventative factors, thinking that colorectal cancer may not be fatal, or believing that only men can get colorectal cancer. And finally, level of educational attainment has real impact on Black patients' ability um, to successfully navigate our systems. And again, I want to highlight the black-white educational achievement gap and how it is rooted in structural racism and how that thus impacts these health disparities that we see. Now, related to healthcare access and quality, research identifies that worse colorectal cancer outcomes for black patients have been attributed to inconsistent primary care lack of physician recommendation for screening, and untrust our untrustworthy medical system, which is rooted in hundreds of years of abuse and neglect that Black people have experienced in these systems. And I want to highlight here that I'm talking about trust under the domain of healthcare. Now, mistrust in the medical system has often been discussed at the person level as a problem in which we need to increase trust among our patients. But I really want to highlight here that this is a systems issue that contributes to cancer disparities. The intervention point is not the patient, but the intervention point is actually the system, which needs to become trustworthy. But as the system is made up of individuals, we all have the opportunity to collectively work to improve trustworthiness of our systems. We can look at policies and structures that may inadvertently be negatively impacting um, patient outcomes in disparate ways. We can look at who makes up and who leads our medical systems. And we can remember that provider actions have also been identified to have significant impacts on colorectal cancer disparities. Specifically, what the literature shows is that providers lack of bias, bias awareness, and management or their lack of who is at high risk, or their lack of time to fully address Black patient concerns contribute, which again points to the systemic nature of this issue, all contribute to colorectal cancer disparities between Black and white patients. And then finally, related to the social and community context, Charles Rogers from Utah has done significant work in this area, understanding what he has called masculinity barriers, which lead to low colorectal cancer screening rates, specifically among Black men. And in his model, he, he details how there are unique cultural barriers to cancer screening, which he again calls these masculinity barriers. Finally, it's also been identified that Black patients may be less likely to know um, their family history. They, have more, they may um, not want to undergo screening because they have more fear about um, what will happen if there's an, a positive diagnosis. And finally, Black people live under conditions of chronic stress and infl inflammation, which may impact cancer. And this unique form of stress has been referred to as allostatic load. And finally, I must also mention that there are biological contributors to colorectal cancer disparities. However, this area often causes confusion in which it leads people to think of race as biological. So I want to be very careful here, and I want to stress that race is merely a, a social construct. It has no biological basis. We've known this since the completion of the Human, human Genome pro Project when we found out we were all 99.9% uh, .9 genetically the same. So I want to be clear that it's not that Black people have a gene that makes them at more at risk for colorectal cancer disparity. That's not it. It's, ra it's rather that there, there are genetic markers that have been um, identified related to colorectal cancer 
And due to genetic ancestry, it's possible that these, that these genes have been identified in people who are Black in our society. But again, I want to highlight um, that it, it's not, say, a black gene that, that every black person has. It's not genetic. And we, but the reason that we must be aware of this and that this is really important because it allows us to look at a black patient and know that they may be at higher risk and we may want to start cancer screening earlier for them. But we also, again, just want to remember, as I've detailed in this presentation, that race really is a social construct and how it largely operates or how it does operate to impact cancer disparities is through social and differential access in wealth, healthcare, education, and environments. Thank you, Dr. Hershey. Um, so to just review some barriers to screening, so there's a strong association between provider communication with patients about colorectal cancer screening and um, compliance with screening. So patients want to hear from us. They want to hear from their healthcare providers that it's recommended. Um, if it's not recommended, they probably will not pursue it because their provider didn't tell them to. Um, there's fear and worry about the procedure or the outcome that they'll be actually diagnosed with a cancer, so they put it off. There's financial challenges, lack of insurance or cost, and even logistical challenges of transportation or time. If you have a person who is a primary breadwinner and if they don't go to work, they don't get paid, they are probably not gonna choose to go for routine colonoscopy or colorectal cancer screening um, rather than going to work and getting paid. So being mindful of these, um, you know, items and barriers um, when um, discussing colorectal cancer screening. And then to briefly touch upon the COVID pandemic screening patterns, um, probably a lot of obvious things here. Um, more people preferred at-home testing versus in-person um, colonoscopy screening. Um, there were concern for um, infection and exposure to infection, um, financial strain and co-pays. Um, and then probably not surprisingly, people were choosing to do at-home screening um, uh, to improve access, which may not necessarily be a bad thing, but again, um, you know, consistency in that. So again, between these barriers and then what we've seen in these screening, um, screening patterns through the pandemic, I can't underscore enough tailoring colorectal cancer screening to each patient's concerns and needs. So now let's wrap up with some preventative um, health topics. So there's ongoing discussion about the use of aspirin in prevention of colorectal cancer. So to briefly review two studies looking at the use of aspirin and um, benefit in colorectal cancer, the first one by Rothwell and colleagues is a follow-up of four randomized controlled, um, controlled trials looking at aspirin dose, which had a wide range of dosing versus control, and looking at the effect of aspirin on risk of colorectal cancer over a 20 year um, period during and after the trials. And that concluded that um, aspirin taken for five years or longer may actually reduce the long-term incidence and mortality of colorectal cancer. The second one was by Sandler and Company, um, which was a randomized double-blind trial of 517 patients looking at aspirin 325 milligrams versus placebo. Um, and looking at the effect of aspirin on the incidence of adenomas. And keep in mind, this was in previous colorectal cancer patients. And this did conclude that um, aspirin played a role in um, the reduction of colorectal adenomas. So will an aspirin a day keep the colorectal cancer away? Well, the American Cancer Society does not recommend taking just for um, lowering colorectal cancer risk if you are at, if you are someone um, at average risk. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force um, does recommend aspirin with some very strict criteria. So low-dose aspirin for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease and colorectal cancer in adults age 50 to 59 who have at least a 10% or greater risk of cardiovascular risk over a 10-year period and are actually willing to take aspirin and have no contraindications. 
you know, under age 50, there's um, insufficient evidence to recommend. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that there are serious or life-threatening side effects with aspirin, such as bleeding um, in, like, from stomach irritation or stomach ulcers, and may actually outweigh the benefits of these medicines for the general public. So still, for some people in their 50s who have a high risk of heart disease, where low-dose aspirin is found to be beneficial, aspirin may have the added benefit of reducing risk of colorectal cancer. Um, but keep in mind, there are serious side effects and reviewing those risks um, prior to initiating. So tree nuts, what about tree nuts? So I think we probably all know that nut consumption is known to reduce the risk of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, so in this study um, by Fidello and colleagues, over 800 patients with a stage three colon cancer were randomized in an adjuvant chemotherapy treatment trial. And they reported on their dietary intake with food frequency questionnaires. And um, the median follow-up was six and a half years. So when they compared patients who did not eat nuts um, to those who had at least two or more servings of nuts per week, it actually showed an improvement in overall survival and disease-free survival in those who were consuming nuts. So two or more servings of tree nuts, so tree nuts, peanuts do not count, they're a legume, so two or more servings of tree nuts may actually be associated with a significantly reduced risk of cancer recurrence and death in patients with a stage three colon cancer. So vitamin D, does it have a role? We don't know yet. Um, the role is um, unknown, but there's lots of discussion about trying to figure out the role of vitamin D. So in the metastatic setting, there has been association um, found between higher plasma levels of vitamin D and improved progression-free survival and overall survival. Um, there's currently a larger confirmatory phase three randomized trial underway looking at this. Um, in the adjuvant setting, there are randomized trials looking um, at the role of vitamin D to confirm benefit. And then in um, prevention, um, still some ongoing investigation of looking at the role of um, vitamin D supplementation. So, um, you know, if checking vitamin D levels, if you have a low vitamin D level, um, certainly worth taking um, a supplement um, for sure. And thinking about other sources of vitamin D from our sun, getting outside, um, um, being out in the sunlight, and then there's other food sources as well. So now these last two topics are areas that I feel play, um, you know, a big role in our overall health um, and have um, more meaningful benefit and probably where I spend the majority of my visits talking with patients. So the role of our diet, we should all be maintaining a healthy weight, getting our fruits and vegetables in, some lean proteins, whole grains, um, things to limit, um, red and processed meat. Researchers are still trying to tease out the exact, um, you know, role of red and processed meats and how it may cause cancer. There's some studies that suggest that preservatives like nitrates and nitrites um, that are added to processed meats can actually produce DNA damage. Um, other studies look at, you know, chemicals that may be produced from um, high heat um, cooking, like grilling, um, that could cause a mutation in, um, uh, that can lead to cancer. So um, risk may rise with the actual amount consumed. So for each um, 50 gram portion of processed meat eaten daily, this could increase the risk of colorectal cancer by about 18%. So um, 50 grams of bacon is roughly three and a half slices. So, so limiting that, um, other things to limit, um, sweet and sugary beverages, um, you know, you'd be surprised how some people may say they don't drink these things. And then you find out they drink tea and you find out it's sweet tea, which is a popular thing um, here in the South. So, you know, really diving deeper into actually what um, patients are drinking and helping educate them. Um, and then highly processed foods and um, refined uh, grain 
products um, we should be limiting. So general rule of thumb, thumb, do your grocery shopping on the outside perimeter of the grocery store. There's probably very little that you need um, up and down the aisles. Um, and then physical activity. Physical activity has lots of health benefits. Um, things like increasing gut motility, enhancing our immune system, decreasing obesity, you know, among other things. So what's the recommendation? The CDC, which is also in alignment with the American Cancer Society guidelines, recommends um, 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. And this is where you get your heart rate up. So when patients tell me, yeah, they walk a lot for work or they're always moving around for work, but if they're not getting their heart rate up, that's where you really get the benefit. So helping clarify that for patients. Um, and then including some muscle strengthening activity um, about two days per week. And probably my favorite here is the one-armed push-ups, which I, I'm not sure how many of us can do that. But um, so working with your patients on, you know, where they are and what their limitations may be, um, even just starting five minutes a day and working that up, um, going to the mailbox every day or, you know, setting um, small um, goals with patients. Um, so I can't highlight enough that any movement counts um, and adjust to patient-specific needs and limitations. Because we know that the effects of um, exercise on health-related outcomes in cancer patients, um, there's strong evidence that um, exercise, getting your heart rate up, can improve cancer-related fatigue, health-related quality of life, um, overall physical functioning, um, anxiety and depression, and even lymphedema. So in a cohort study of almost 1,000 patients with colon cancer, um, those that followed the American Cancer Society guidelines for nutrition and physical activity were actually shown that it may um, improve survival, and there was a 9% absolute risk reduction um, of risk of death at five years. So healthy diet, being physically active, plays a, a big role in our overall health, in, including colorectal cancer. So to wrap up and highlight the benefits of screening and screening early, screening on time, reducing um, premature death. When we diagnose cancer early, we know that that overall survival is improved. Um, detecting cancer at earlier stages, um, ideally, with this lower age recommendation, we'll increase the group, um, the age group of 50 to 54, because now they'll feel like they're behind getting screened. Um, and then encouraging our high-risk groups um, and identifying high-risk families, um, for example, with Lynch syndrome. So um, focusing on family history, obtaining um, accurate family histories. Um, so get out there, tell your friends, colleagues, patients um, to get their colonoscopy screening and um, remind everyone about this new um, age. 45 is the new 50, so don't get left behind. So thank you all for hanging with me today. Um, and these are our references. And we're open for questions. Great. And uh, Tammy, thank you so much. This is a lot of information here. This has been great. I know it is actually one minute after the hour. So, uh, you know, for those in our audience who must leave because you have uh, other, other duties to attend to, we certainly understand that. Uh, Tammy, if you do have a few minutes, we'd love for you to stay on and take at least a few of the, the many questions that have been coming in over the last 20 minutes or so. So the, yeah, that, is, is that all right? Do you have a, a yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I okay, have right. um, a quick minute or two um, before I run back to clinic, but thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, this is unfortunate. Um, the family member, I don't know what age they were diagnosed, so I think it's important to share that information. Um, insurance companies are. Um, very challenging. Um, I'll, I'll be kind. Um, you know, I actually tried to get, um, I mean, my husband was average risk, but tried to get him screened and our insurance company, you know, wouldn't do it. But I think this high risk and um, pointing that out to the insurance company, especially the age of onset of um, the mother with cancer. Um, you know, uh, my role 
100% of my patients already have cancer. So, um, you know, these recommendations and getting screened, they usually always have a colonoscopy screening, but I certainly work with families and talk with them about getting their um, loved ones um, and their children screened or, um, you know, siblings screened. All right. Uh, one question that came in in the chat, uh, what strategies are in current practice to lower the disparity of black patients? Yeah, I mean, ongoing dis discussions. I mean, I think I wish Rachel was here. She does a lot of work and research in this arena. Um, I think, you know, for my one gentleman um, who, you know, it took almost a, a year, you know, education, I think, is um, and, and bringing the discussion to the forefront is what where we're going to make a difference. Hence, why I pulled Rachel into this talk to um, highlight these disparities and have conversation. And um, so I, I think that's probably one of our best options, continuing to talk about it. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, another question. After removing uh, a polyp growing in the appendix, how often and what tests are recommended? Yeah, this can vary. Um, there's some more detail that can go into that. When people have polyps removed, especially if they're a younger age population, um, many times they'll be recommended to do yearly colonoscopies. Um, and then the further they get out or less polyps, sometimes that can even be stretched to every three years. Great, thank you so much. Uh, another question here, uh, to increase CRC awareness, do you think it would be helpful to start education as early as high school? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. You know, sure, I think one of, you know, with this question, it makes me think about all of our young people that may not be paying attention to their family history or, you know, actually some who may not even know their family history or, um, you know, talking with their healthcare providers, you know, how many times does that get, um, you know, just least of the concerns when you come in with a, you know, complaint or some other issue. But um, I, I certainly think with this higher incidence of our um, lower age population, um, as much into education highlighting the role of our diet and exercise and sedentary lifestyles and getting high schoolers off gaming and outside in the sunlight and being physically active. Um, certainly, I think that's a great idea. Right. And I know we're running out of time and we had several other questions. I'm going to ask for the, our audience's forgiveness if I try to summarize some of this, but but uh, into, into maybe one or two, well, one question. So given that, that we know the role of bias um, and the impact that this has on people of color, are, are, are there certain things that, that both uh, healthcare practitioners and that patients can do when they're concerned that that bias exists to uh, address that bias, uh, either as a patient for, for their own concerns about their health or as a healthcare provider to address uh, bias that they may be aware of from, from other healthcare practitioners? Yeah, um, I, I, again, I, I'm gonna answer as previously with you know conversation and, and highlighting it that it that it has, that it's happening, which, you know, probably is a, a tough thing to do. Um, I do want to say before more people are trying to hop off, um, feel free to email Rachel, um, Dr. Rachel, Rachel Hershey or myself, especially when it comes to this disparities where Rachel spends a lot of um, work and um, research. Um, she, I got her permission. She is certainly open to emailing for, um, you know, ongoing discussion or questions or things you guys can do. That, that would be great. I think, I think there, you know, I know there's a, a sense of, of impatience. Sometimes we, we're so aware of the disparities and, and, and yet as, as disturbing as these are, we're, and I know as a, as, a, as a population, we're very anxious to address these, you know, as, as a community to address these and, and not just know the problems, but, but I have a better understanding of how as quickly as possible these can be addressed. Right. 
So, so that, that would be great. And we'll make sure that those uh, email addresses are shared. Um, all right, if you can advance to the next slide, please. Thank you so much to our, our audience for, for hanging in there with us as we go just a couple of minutes over time. I'll wrap up very quickly. We want to thank uh, the, the people of North Carolina for their generous support of the University Cancer Research Fund and the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center at UNC. We want to thank Mary King, John Powell, uh, Veneranda Obure, Oliver Marth, Jason Paler, and Andrew Dodgson for all of their hard work on each and every one of these lectures.